Good morning everyone and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival online. My name is Cathy Hunter and I'm very happy to be hosting this morning's session from Strumness in Orkney. This year marks the Orkney International Science Festival's 30th anniversary and we are celebrating the occasion with our very first online festival. We are delighted to be able to bring a full festival programme directly to you wherever you happen to be for the moment. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, John Goodlad, who joins us this morning from Shetland. Native to Shetland, John Goodlad has worked in the seafood industry all his life. He has represented fishermen, has run his own fish farming business, and currently works for a London-based seafood investment fund. His long interest in fishing history eventually resulted in the publication of his book, The Cod Hunters, a couple of years ago. We're really looking forward to hearing from John this morning. And if you have any questions for him during his talk, please just pop them into YouTube's live chat and we'll go through them at the end. We hope you enjoy John's talk. Thank you. And over to you, John. Thank you, Cathy. Um, if we could have the first slide, please. Um, I'm very, very happy to be taking place in this online festival. Um, I've always, as Cathy has said, worked in the seafood industry. And uh, for many years, I've been really interested in a particular part of Shetland's fishing history, uh, which involved Shetlanders catching cod all over the North Atlantic, from Iceland, Greenland, the Faroes, and salting this cod and then exporting it to, to Spain. Uh, it was an incredible period of Shetland fishing history, um, uh, incredible impact on Shetland from an economic perspective during the 19th century. But as I began to research the fishery, it became clear that there were really interesting social and cultural aspects that emerged out of this fishery. Um, and that's really what led me to decide to write a book. So I hope uh, my book is more than simply a chronology of an interesting fishery. It's actually a chronology of the amazingly close cultural links that were built up between the Shetland Islands and our next door neighbour, not Orkney in this case, but our other next door neighbour, the Faroe Islands. Um, so what I want to do, if you could have the next slide, please, uh, today is uh, the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, what I want to do today is quickly run through uh, a chronology of the fishery, uh, then look how the fishery began to develop in Faroe and Shetland's part in that, and then look at two really interesting aspects of this Faroese connection, one being uh, the linguistic connections that still existed between Shetland mm -hmm. speaking Shetlandic and the Faroese language in the late 19th century, and uh, an interesting uh, aspect of the fishery was the smuggling trade that developed uh, between Faroe and Shetland. And finally, I'll have a look at uh, some of the uh, losses of vessels at the time and some of the art, uh, wonderful art that that's generated uh, in the Faroe Islands. And that's the front cover of my book, which you, you just saw. Um, so the fishery itself began in 1818 and lasted until 1908. So it almost lasted 100 years. Um, to give you an indication of the scope of the fishery, next slide, please. Um, the fishery began with some Shetland fishing vessels fishing southwest of Fula, north of Westry, in an area which was known as the home grounds, known today as the Papa Bank. Uh, that fishery then quickly expanded with Shetlanders fishing at Rockall, at the Faroe Bank, inshore at Faroe on the Faroe coast, and also the northeast coast of Iceland, uh, the coastal grounds uh, shown here. And finally, next slide please, uh, also an expansion into west coast of Greenland, into Disco Bay uh, and the Davis Straits. It was undertaken by large sailing vessels, next slide please, and these were called smacks. Here's one of the few photographs that exist taken in Scalloway in the early part of the 20th century of one of the last Shetland smacks. Two, vest two masted vessels, uh, wooden, uh, powered entirely by sail, of course, 
uh, fishing with a crew of perhaps 12, 14, and even the bigger ones, sometimes 16 uh, fishermen on board. Um, uh, next slide, please. And uh, lack of photography at the time has led to some interesting uh, paintings of these vessels. So here's uh, the uh, William Martin, very famous Shetland smack. Uh, this painting hangs in the Shetland Museum. And next one, please. And here's a, a model of a smack, the Buttercup which interestingly enough hangs in a church in the Faroe Islands. And I'll talk a bit later in the lecture about the very close links between Faroe and Shetland with regard to this fishery. Um, it's interesting, the buttercup hanging in this church in the Faroes, probably more Faroese know about the history of this famous Shetland fishing vessel than most modern day Shetlanders do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, fishing technique was incredibly simple, uh, a single hand line with two hooks. Uh, some of your Arcadian listeners may be familiar with this technique of catching cod. It was developed first by the Basques in the 16th century fishing at Newfoundland and quickly expanded over all of North Europe, including Shetland. Next slide, please. The lines were baited and each fisherman would work his own line with two hooks and the lines were hauled to the boat uh, whenever one or two cod were caught. Next slide, please. Uh, and here's a, one of the many sketches I've used in my book um, uh, of, uh, of the crew taking uh, some of these very large cod off the, off the hooks as the lines were hauled on board. Once the cod came on board, the cod was, uh, was bled, it was headed, it was gutted, and then it was split, uh, whereby it, 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 it made one very large fillet with a bit of the bone in the back. Uh, next slide, please. And when the, the vessels returned to Shetland, they unloaded after a 12 week uh, trip, 12, 14 week trip, the vessel was full of salt cod. And these salt cod were then landed where in Shetland, where they were laid out in beaches, on stone beaches, where a combination of sun, or those of you who know Shetland well, wind, probably more than sun, dried the salt cod into dried salt, salt cod, which became hard as a piece of wood and could be kept in that preserved state for many, many years. Uh, this work uh, on the beaches was undertaken by uh, young boys, young teenage boys, and they were known as the beach boys. And Shetland's full, as is Orkney, of these stone beaches. And it's hard to believe that this fishery had reached such a, 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 a level of importance that there were almost a hundred of these sailing smacks employing a thousand fishermen. And back home in Shetland, every beach with every stone beach was covered in dried salt cod or salt cod drying in the sun. So from a distance, you'd see these beaches in the summertime and they'd all be glistening white as if they were covered in snow. It must have been an incredible sight. Next slide, please. Uh, and every evening, every night, the cod was gathered up into these uh, cubes known as steeples, covered with tarpaulins to protect uh, the cod from the dew. And of course, whenever there was the threat of a shower, uh, uh, the cod had to be gathered up uh, into these steeples and covered up until the rain passed. So being a beach boy, working on a beach, keeping cod dry uh, in the 19th century wasn't easy. I've mentioned how this fishery dominated the Shetland economy. It came to dominate the economies of much of Northern Europe, in the Faroes, in Norway and in Iceland. And it's difficult to imagine in our modern world how vitally important um, uh, one industry can be, where most people are working in it, most people are relying on it for a living and its physical dominance in terms of the boats coming into the harbour, the salt fish laid out in every beach to dry, people eating salt cod, this big part of the diet. It came to dominate life in Shetland. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and there's a wonderful quote by uh, Iceland's famous novelist, Haldor Laxness, uh, who won the, the Nobel Prize for his famous book, Independent People. In another book he wrote called Salka Valda in 1931, he, he was describing the 19th century uh, uh, in Iceland where the salt cod business also dominated Icelandic society and economy. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I thought that was just a wonderful quote that summed up what I'm trying to say. Uh, 
When all is said and done, said Halder Laxness, life is first and foremost about salt fish. So somebody who's written a book about salt cod, I should love that quote. Uh, now, the salt cod business is not only about history. Uh, Shetland no longer produces salt cod. It disappeared from Shetland. But it's still produced in some parts of northern Scandinavia, and it's still exported to Spain, where it forms the basis of that incredible Iberian cuisine, bacalao, which I'm sure uh, many of you who have been on holidays to Spain and Portugal have tasted. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a photograph I took at the Brussels Seafood Show about three, four years ago. And this is a Norwegian company selling dried salted cod uh, in the 21st century to Spanish customers. And here was an example of the product. And what this lady is holding up uh, in 2016 or whenever it was, is exactly the same product that uh, we, I showed you the photographs lying on the beaches drying in Shetland. Uh, so next slide, please. I mentioned about how the fishery took place in the cold Arctic waters, Greenland, Iceland. The finished product uh, was mostly sold to Bilbao and Santander in Spain. So uh, Shetlanders were at the, at the hub of this network stretching from the Arctic, the cold Arctic waters, right down to the balmy, warm waters of northern Spain, where Shetland dried cod uh, was sold for almost 100 years. Um, from this map, you'll also see uh, that uh, some cod was sold into Grimsby and then transported to London. And this was really quite an interesting uh, and quite different aspect of the cod fishery. In the 1870s and the 1880s, the emerging middle class in London developed a quite insatiable appetite for absolutely fresh fish, especially fresh cod. So anybody who could supply fresh cod to London got a very, very good price. So some enterprising Shetlanders uh, decided when they were fishing uh, in Iceland or Faroe that they would install seawater holds, uh, seawater wells in their vessels uh, with watertight bulkheads fore and aft and holes drilled in the side of the vessel. It sounds, it sounds incredibly dangerous, but it was perfectly seaworthy if it was done properly. So for the last week of fishing, they would fill these wells full of live cod, sail all the way back to Grimsby, where the live cod was stored in wooden boxes in the Humber estuary. And um, next slide, please. And this is a, 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 a sketch from the Illustrated London News of 1875. And this shows the live boxes uh, being taken into the pier at Grimsby. So the fish merchants from London would on a daily basis uh, inform the fish merchants in Grimsby how many hundred live cod they needed on that day. The live cod were taken in, were harvested from the wooden boxes, which the Shetlanders had landed them into, perhaps the day or the week or two weeks before. Uh, and the cod was then dispatched by train down to London. So the consumers in London were getting cod that was no more than one or perhaps one day, 24 hours, or perhaps 36 hours old. And uh, we often think we live in a very, very modern world, but I can guarantee you that in no restaurant in London today will you get cod as fresh as 24 hours old. It'll be at best three or four days old and more likely a week old. So an incredible, uh, piece of technological innovation by the Shetlanders, putting wells in their hold. The amount of fish that came down uh, wasn't huge, perhaps just 5% of the total catch, but very, very high prices. And this made a, uh, a very, very important uh, contribution to the total earning of the fleet. Um, the fishery then uh, began to decline in the 1880s and 1890s, not because there was anything wrong with the economics of the fishery or the cod stock was in danger or anything like that. But Shetland had discovered a new fishery, the herring fishery, which uh, generated greater profits and greater crew wages. A fisherman could earn perhaps three times as much for his year as a herring fisherman than he could as a cod fisherman. So Shetlanders mm -hmm. voted with their feet and they became herring fishermen and the, uh, the cod fishery went into pretty uh, serious decline in the 1880s and 1890s. 
during this period, uh, there was an attempt to try and keep the cod fishery going by employing Faroese crew on board the remaining Shetland smacks. And for perhaps 20 or 30 years, many of these smacks fished with part Shetland crews, part Faroese crews. And then finally, a lot of the smacks were sold to the Faroe Islands as the Faroese began to develop their own cod fishery. So the Shetlanders passed on to the Faroese the fishing and curing skills. Hundreds of Faroese had been cruised, crews on board Shetlanders, and then eventually the vessels were sold to Faroe. Next slide, please. And those of you who have been to Faroe will know it's got much in common with Orkney and Shetland and, and, and obviously very much different. This is a, one of my favourite uh, places in the Faroes, uh, the Tindholm and the entry to Sorvagsfjord, a fjord where Shetlanders used to go and shelter during uh, times of bad weather. And there are many memories of this particular fjord of the Shetlanders coming uh, ashore more than 100 years ago. So the Faroese began to develop their fishing industry uh, very much based on the skills they learned from Shetland uh, and Shetland cod fishermen. And the, uh, the Faroese, of course, have a very, very modern fishing industry. They're one of the global leaders in seafood. Uh, but the Faroese are very generous in their praise uh, about how uh, they didn't uh, build this industry themselves. They learned from the, the Shetlanders. And there's a wonderful quote uh, from Johannes Patterson uh, when he made a visit to Shetland in the, uh, in the 1920s, I think it was the late 1920s, and he made a, a speech in the Lerwick Town Hall about the links between Faroe and Shetland and how the Shetlanders uh, uh, had been able to, uh, to learn, these skill, uh, learn the Faroese these skills. So next slide, please. It's a slightly flowery language, but I think it's worth uh, just quoting. So Johannes Patterson, who was at this time one of the early campaigners for home rule in the Faroe Islands uh, and a very, a very well-known Faroese uh, uh, gentleman, said to his Shetland audience, once again, Shetlanders and Faroe men joined hands first some 60 or 70 years ago when our common heritage, the great highway of our common Viking ancestors, the deep rolling blue oceans, that brings us our greatest material riches, but also takes with ruthless hand our finest manhood, brought your fishing fleets to our shores, and Shetlanders first taught us deep sea fishing in decked vessels. And those of you who have ever spent any time at sea will recognize the very special bond that develops between people who sail together and people who fish together. And this led to a very deep and profound relationship between the two fishing communities in Shetland and Faroe. Uh, next photograph, please. Next slide, please. This is a photograph uh, of one of the crews uh, of Shetland Smack. This is the crew of the Lily of the Valley. And I show this because photographs of the Shetland crews weren't commonplace and they never took place in Shetland. As soon as the crew got back to Shetland, they were busy discharging their cargo of salt cod and then going home for a few days rest before they reprovisioned their vessel to go back for another 12 week fishing trip. But when they were in the Faroe Islands, holed up with bad weather, uh, they had plenty of time in their hands. And there was a tradition of the crews going to photographers in Toshhaven to get their photograph taken. So this is a photograph of a, of a crew of Shetlanders on Lily of the Valley taken by a photographer in Toshhaven. I first went to the Faroe Islands uh, when I was at university uh, many, many years ago. And uh, I was very taken aback. Uh, it was a foreign country, and yet it felt so much like Shetland. The harbours were busy, busy with fishing boats. The Shetland, uh, the, the Faroese uh, small open boat was almost a, a carbon copy of the Shetland Sixerine. I felt very much at home. and. There's something called genetic memory, uh, which and many of my own ancestors had been cod fishermen and had spent a lot of time in Pharaoh. So perhaps there was something uh, coursing through my DNA because I felt very much at home in Toshhaven and in many of the Faroese villages. And one of the things which made me feel very much at home was the language. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, although I can't speak Faroese, uh, I suddenly was able to pick up many words that I knew exactly what they were. 
as a Shetlander. And I just put a few here to illustrate. Uh, the Shetland word for a porpoise is a nisic. In Faroe, it's nisa. The Shetland word for a, a black gullimut is a tasty. The Faroese call it a tasty, exactly the same. We call oyster catchers shelders in Shetland. In Faroese, it's shelter. Um, and the language is full of all these linguistic uh, similarities. And of course, the place names are almost identical. Uh, we have whiteness, they have fitness, sand, sand, exactly the same. We call the island Fula in the Faroes, their bird island is called Fugloi. We use the word Vo in Faroe, it's Vaga. So these linguistic connections really fascinated me. And in my book, uh, I, I talk a bit about this. And I'm going to read a very, very short piece uh, from uh, my book uh, about these linguistic connections. Simon of Scardi was a school teacher in the Faroes. He founded a high school in 1899 near Claxvik as the first school where Faroese was used instead of Danish as the language of instruction. He was also a leading member of the Faroese Home Rule Party. Simmons' name was not actually Scardi, but he was known as such following the Fer Faroese tradition of being described by the village he came from, a tradition once very common in Shetland as well. Scarth was a very small village on the island of Kunoi. His father, Johannes Johansson, was the blacksmith in the village and foreign vessels often anchored off the village in order to get repairs undertaken by him. Simon of Scardi recollected that when he was a young boy, several fishermen from the Shetland smacks visited their house year after year. He particularly remembered one Shetlander with a long tawny beard speaking to his father's mother, who had no English, in his old Shetland tongue. They could apparently understand each other and conduct a conversation of sorts. The Shetlander was James Christie of Westerwick near Skeld, who had fished at Faroe for many years and was known as an expert cod splitter who excelled in the art of curing fish on board the smacks. And of course, in the 19th century, Shetlanders had lost their Old Norse tongue, but the Shetland dialect or Shetlandic was strong enough that uh, it was possible uh, from this example and many others that I discovered for a conversation of sorts to be had by Shetlanders speaking Shetlandic and Faroese who had no knowledge of English. And this would have been very evident, of course, when you had uh, the Faroese and Shetland crews working alongside each other on board the, the smacks. Uh, next slide, please. Another fascinating uh, aspect which connected Faroe and Shetland was alcohol and tobacco. In the Faroes in the 19th century, there was for some reason no excise duty. So the Faroes uh, were like a huge duty-free store. In Shetland, the British excise duties rate supplied. So there was a huge uh, opportunity for Shetland cod fishermen to buy brandy and tobacco very, very cheaply and take back. And I'd been brought up as a young boy on stories of Faroe brandy and smuggling from Faroe. This photograph is a, is, is a, is a, uh, a brandy pig. This, these were the chars in which the brandy was sold. Um, and I'd always believed that, uh, that the uh, brandy and tobacco were simply used for home consumption. But uh, next slide, please. Um, but I was saying, I sailed up to the Faroes when I began researching my book. I, I, I took a sailing trip to the Faroes on board the Swan, which is one of Shetland's restored sailboats, an old herring sloop. And uh, we were in the island of Suderoy uh, in uh, Tveroiri. And uh, just before we were due to leave, uh, I was in the cafe here, uh, which is owned by Anna Kristen Thompson. Um, and we were having a beer or a coffee before we were, were going to leave. And she came across and said, you're from Shetland. And I said, that's right. Yes. And she said, uh, yes, I saw the boat in and the Shetland flag. She said, did you know that uh, my great grandfather used to run this cafe as a merchant store and he used to sell uh, tobacco and uh, brandy to the Shetlanders? And I said, yeah, I'd heard about that. That was, you know. And she says, yeah, all the records still exist. And I said, 
you know, are they in a, I was really interested because I wanted to see these records. Are they in an archive in, in Toshhaven or perhaps Copenhagen? She said, no, no, they're next door. And so we went into a room next door and there were all the old ledgers from 150 years before detailing in incredible detail the uh, number of transactions, the name of the Shetland fisherman, the vessel the Shetland fisherman was on, how much brandy and how much tobacco he bought, how much he paid for it. And when I, I, I then came back subsequently and went through these records. And I was astonished at two things. First of all, the quantities that were bought. Uh, Shetland cod fishermen at this time would have earned anything from 18 to 20 pounds per year for fishing for cod. Some of these fishermen were buying brandy to the tune of 25 and 30 pounds. Now imagine if you're engaged in an illicit illegal activity and you're spending your annual salary or perhaps 50% more than your annual salary in buying contraband. Clearly this wasn't for home consumption mm -hmm. and clearly there was a huge trade when the Shetlanders got back home to Shetland in selling the brandy and tobacco as a profit margin. Um, now, there, was, there are no records of this in Shetland for obvious reasons. It was all illegal, it was all illicit. But here we have in uh, Tferoiri in the Faroe Islands exact records of how much brandy and tobacco had been bought. That amazed me. And the second thing which absolutely astonished me was that the Faroese merchants gave the Shetlanders a year's credit. They bought the brandy in 1874, they only paid for it in 1875. So, you know, there were, that's how the Shetlanders were able to afford to do it. They'd sold the brandy at their profitable prices when they came back to pay it uh, the next year. But it showed the very uh, trusting and close uh, bonds that existed between the Thompson merchant family in Suderoy and the Shet Shetland cod fishermen. They had every confidence that the Shetlanders uh, would repay, would pay in full for the brandy and tobacco they bought. Uh, um, so I'm going to try and conclude now. And I mentioned uh, uh, about the losses of ships. And during the 100 year period, I think there were something like 17 cod sloops lost, uh, all, uh, most of which with a full loss of life of 12, 14 men. Dreadful, ter terrible. Um, next slide, please. Um, Rudyard Kipling is not the most politically correct uh, authors these days, but I just love this poem, uh, which he wrote in 1906, the harp song of the Dane. And these few lines encapsulate to my mind uh, what was going on. Uh, and perhaps from an industry that was dominated by men begins to encapsulate what it felt to be like to be a woman left behind. What is a woman that you forsake her and the hearth fire and the homemaker to go with the old grey widowmaker? And the North Atlantic, even in summertime, isn't blue, it's grey. And it became an old grey widowmaker uh, for so many families. And in the Faroes, where the Faroese really began to develop their cod fishery as the Shetlanders abandoned cod for fishing for herring, so the Faroese uh, went through the trauma of many, many vessels uh, being lost. Um, next slide, please. And here's a, a photograph from about the 1920s on board a Faroese cod sloop, probably a Shetland sloop that had been sold to Faro. Um, it shows a, a, a rough day, the sea spilling over the rail onto the deck. But the interesting thing about this slide is that the Faroese fishermen standing there obviously isn't at all perturbed. And what's more remarkable, he doesn't have his heavy weather gear on. He's simply wearing his jumper. He doesn't have his old skins on. So this was not at all remarkable. Didn't even merit putting his old skins on for. So you can begin to imagine what the conditions were like. Next slide, please. And here's a, a, a painting from a famous Faroese artist of a Faroese smack, the Chohana which uh, often calls into Kirkwall as well as Lerwick and Scalloway. 
Um, she's restored now, and this is her uh, in the early 20th century, making heavy weather uh, fully reefed down. So I want to end now looking at how the Faroese dealt with these losses. And in the Faroes, in the way perhaps that music is what culturally defined Shetland and Orkney to some extent, but in the Faroes, they tend to define themselves culturally through their art. Uh, and there's a whole range of very, very famous Faroese artists, one of the most famous of whom uh, was an artist called Samuel Mikinis, uh, Samuel Johnson, who grew up on a small island called Mikinis. And he grew up as a small boy during the times when many smacks were being lost and many uh, families were being left. And he's painted... Uh, many, many pictures mm. depicting this loss. And it's interesting that his pictures don't depict the men at sea on the boats. Mm. His pictures depict the women and children left at home. And I think that's very fitting because like so much history, uh, all that's written about the cod smacks is about the fishermen and the beach boys. But the role of women uh, in this whole story has, uh, because of a lack of written records, been completely, uh, completely... Um, I think, uh, missed out and, and forgotten. Uh, and so Mykonos' paintings, to some extent, I think, uh, make that very clear. Um, so just three slides to finish off. The next slide, please. And here's the Prime Minister of the Faroe Islands in 2008, uh, writing an appreciation of Samuel Johansson Mykonos, this artist that I'm telling you about. And he says... He paints the women with their children on the desolate shore, watching the ships leave for the Icelandic fishing grounds. He paints those who anxiously wait for their loved ones to return. And he describes their dread, despair and sense of loss at the news of a death. He portrays their sorrow, but also their hope and faith. So I've got two, two, two uh, copies of, uh, of Mykonos' paintings. Uh, the first one, next slide please, is one that is full of hope and faith. He is a young Faroese woman looking out to sea, and you'll see in the distance a small smack making its way perhaps to Iceland, perhaps to Greenland. And she's looking, and uh, uh, perhaps it's her father, perhaps it's her husband, maybe her brother, and she's full perhaps of anticipation that they will all return safely. And the next slide uh, is an altogether different uh, portrait. Here are uh, a family, a mother with a daughter and a son. The sea is black. It paints a very bleak picture. There are three smacks leaving uh, the pharaohs going to sea. The mother can't look at the ships leaving. She's worried her husband won't come back. Her daughter shares that sense of foreboding. She's hanging on to her mother's arm, uh, also unable to look. The son, on the other hand, he steals a glance over his mother's shoulder. And you're left wondering, is he longing for the day that he'll be able to join his father and brothers on the smack? Or is he dreading the day that he will be joining them on the smock, on the smack? Because like Shetlanders, there was no alternative. Uh, you either became a fisherman or you went hungry. So um, uh, I think that this art from the Pharaohs speaks so much about uh, the social uh, aspects uh, of the fishery, not only in Pharaoh, but in Shetland. We didn't have artists to capture this at the time. Uh, next slide, please. And I used this... Uh, uh, the, the more upbeat of his two paintings uh, for the cover of my book, because it reminds me of a story that I had heard of my great, my own great grandmother, who used to stand at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of the vow, whiteness vow, vo, looking for her husband to come home uh, on his smack, and she would stand uh, um, every time expecting him back, and would see him coming back until, of course, the dreaded day where she stood and went week after week, and the smack never came back. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, it's an incredible period of Shetland fishing history, economically, but also socially and culturally. It was an international fishery, 
Shetlanders were at the hub of a of a wheel stretching from the north of Europe and the Arctic right down to Spain. And the cultural, social, uh, and economic links between Faroe and Shetland really became very important and incredibly deep. Three generations of Shetlanders fished with, traded with, and smuggled uh, alongside uh, Faroese. And in turn, the Faroese can trace their origins as one of the global, global leaders in the seafood industry to these early days of the Shetland cod hunters. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that fascinating talk. It's amazing the similarities um, between the Faroes and the Shetland. I found that very, very interesting. We do have some questions from the audience. Um, so we'll just kick it off with this one from Richards coming. What timber was used to build the boats? Um, it was, uh, these boats were uh, mostly all built in England and bought second hand to Shetland, although a few were built brand new in Hall, Hall's Yard in Aberdeen in the 1870s. And as was standard at these times, it was, uh, uh, larch on oak. The beams were made of oak and the planks were made of larch. Right, lovely, thank you. Um, we've got another question here from Richard. Do you have any idea of the total value of the smuggling that went on? No, it's the honest answer. Um, I was astonished at those levels of, uh, of smuggling and I was just capturing the records of one merchant in one Faroese village. Uh, I understand that many of the records from other Faroese merchants have been lost, been destroyed, uh, but it would be a wonderful PhD for a student to go around the Faroes and collect all the records and do the analysis I did uh, and add it up. And uh, it could be that if you're buying brandy to as much as what your wages were for a year, that this really was a was a big the the cod fishery was a big business to shetland but i think the sale of brandy uh during the winter months uh, illicitly and illegally must also have been very very big it's staggering it really is um another qu question from me this time actually is there still interaction between pharaoh and shetland does that still is it has that continued into today at all, even in a kind of... Yeah, it, 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 it's one of these things that comes and goes. I mean, since my first trip to the Faroes, it's one of my favourite places. I personally have been back 12 or 14 times. I've hollered there. I've been there on business. I know many Faroese and many Shetlanders do have Faroese links. It was very, very good for about 10 years when the Faroese ferry called into Lerwe. So we had a weekly ferry connection with Torshaven um, for about 10 years, once a week. And that was really good. Many Faroese came to Shetland and Shetlanders went to Faroe. And that rekindled a lot of the friendships. But that, for various reasons, stopped. Um, and uh, for a couple of years, the Air Atlantic that uh, flew, flies mm -hmm. from uh, London to Torshaven used to call in past Sumbra. So that was a connection that helped. But no, this, uh, those transport links have gone. Um, some Shetland vessels land fish to the Faroes, some Faroese vessels land fish in Shetland. But it comes and goes. And unfortunately, at this point in time, our uh, Faroese connections are less than, you, you know, they have been at certain stages in the past, which is a great pity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've got a comment here from Swain. He says, amazing pictures. Still cannot believe that these boats had next to no shelter at all because they didn't, did they? It was very exposed for the fishermen and they were on them for eight, for weeks at a time, weren't they? Absolutely. No wheelhouse. Um, you stood, the, 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 the person on watch steering the boat would either be steering with a wheel or more likely a helm and uh, just on deck. Uh, as the waves broke over. Obviously, they wouldn't uh, be fishing in, in severe gales, but would be fishing in rough weather, and you'd have the entire crew on the deck fishing. So no shelter whatsoever. And uh, you're talking about what the boats were built of. Um, they were all wooden. They, no built, boats were built of iron at all. And the comment was, this was the time of iron men in wooden boats. <laughs> 
very very nice yeah it's just it's unbelievable really now um let me see I think that is all of our questions lots of comments coming in saying that was just such a great great talk superb um it's been very interesting I've loved listening along today um so I'd just like to say a final thank you to you John um Thank you to all of you participating, uh, watching and commenting, and a huge thank you as well to our technical team behind the scenes. Uh, without all their hard work over these last weeks and months, none of this would have been possible. Um, so I've just got a bit to say about our next talk today. It's at 11.30. Um, join us then to hear Zoe Christiansen on Seaweed from the Arctic Circle. If you'd like to carry on this morning's conversation, please do come along to the PD Kirk lunches and the Festival Club. There are still spaces available for the PD Kirk lunches and you can register for these on the website. Uh, we'd also love it if you all came along to the Festival Club tonight from nine o'clock. We should be sharing the link for that in the live chat just now. Um, if you are enjoying the festival, please do like us on our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be lovely, thank you. So with that, thank you so much, John. Um, thank you to all of you. Good morning and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.